What's up, Michelle here, and in this video I'm going to be talking about my experiences of being in a UK prison. It's the video that won the vote. Um, every week I ask my followers to vote, what video shall I do next, people? Um, and if you want to get involved in that vote, uh, please press that subscribe button. I'm almost at a thousand, and it honestly means the world to me. Um, and if you go in the comment section, you'll find a, like a pinned choice and just select out of one of those and the winner gets the video. But also, I want you to think of some questions while you're watching this video that come to mind. And, you know, if you've got any, just pop them in the comments and, you know, I'll answer the questions the next video. All right. So first of all, the first thing I'm going to say about my experiences in, in, in prisons in the UK are that they're full of people with mental health problems and, excuse me, it's really horrible, you know, and that's why I ended up in there, because it's, there's this thing in the UK now that, you know, struggling and being suicidal and, you know, you end up in prison and because there isn't any support. And I'll say this, if you're new to me, I am a, an author, I am a passionate mental health campaigner and I am a motivational speaker. Um, unfortunately, I was locked up at 12 years old in a corrupt UK mental hospital in Newcastle upon Tyne, and I was subjected to many years of abuse. Um, when I was abu uh, when I was released from that place, I got very little support. I ended up in a you know dirty bed sit on my own, no family support, nothing. I struggled, and I did do very suicide attempts. I did drink a lot, you know. And that is what ended me up in prison. Um, one of those times I basically slit all down my arms and my wrists, resulting in, you know, lifelong scars and a lot of stitches. I was ringing the crisis team and I was saying, you know, you need to section me because I feel like I'm not, I'm, I'm a risk to myself and I'll probably die here. And they kept saying, look, you've got capacity and, you know, it's your choice and stop ringing us, basically. And they sent me to court and said it's challenging behaviour and attention seeking and they put me in prison. Um, I was assessed while I was in prison as being unwell in there and they released me and put me in hospital. So that just shows that this, the system isn't working. Another time I had an overdose attempt. Um, I survived gladly. I was speaking to a woman who appeared very dismissive. Um, she had a load of leaflets in a bag with her and she gave me a leaflet and she said, look, you know, you're not that bad, to be honest. There's other people worse than you. We only have a certain amount of beds in the area and, you know, you need to kind of use all these relaxation techniques. And don't get me wrong, you know, relaxation techniques have helped me, but when you're in an acute crisis, you need more than that. You know, you need someone to talk to and regular support and... I just found it really dismissive and I do regret this and it's not right that I did this so I must stress that but I ripped the leaflet up and I thought she was laughing at me so I hit her. I gave her the one strike and I got charged with a common assault. So it's all mental health related like I said it, I, there's no excuse for that and I do regret doing that but I was highly upset and I was stressed and I was struggling. Um, so my experience is that I got handcuffed, I got taken to the police cell, interviewed and all that. After that was done, I was in the court. I was then taken down a flight of stairs, put in another holding cell for about three or four hours. I was given teas, coffees, biscuits and sandwiches. Then I was put in another van and taken to the prison. I've been in New Hall. Um, and I've written extensively about that experience as well because while I was there, two women commit suicide and that's just another indication of how bad th this mental health crisis is in the UK. You know, people aren't getting help and people are getting put in prisons because the drains on resources and stuff like that and it's just horrendous. Um, it really is, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, after that, I arrived at the prison. Uh, my handcuffs were taken off. I was weighed. I had was height, 
blood pressure, um, everything, you know, all these different physical tests done on me. I was asked all sorts of questions, um, like if there is any history of physical conditions, like have you got a religion, or have you got, what's your sexuality, or like I've got children, I've got a partner, like all these different questions, anything they asked me. Um, they asked me about my hobbies, everything, and after that I was given a plate, a spoon, I think I was given like some shampoo and like little, um, like little sachets. Um, oh, I think I was given a hairbrush, I can't really remember, it's that long ago. And I was given like a pin number for the phone because um, in the prison you can't just pick up the phone and ring who you like. You have to write down like the numbers that you want to speak to and then the guards and the security people have to then ring up to say look is you know who are you basically and the kind of like the assess if it's appropriate um which i can kind of understand because there's a lot of like drug ties and stuff and gangs and that in prison so i get that um and i didn't have many people on my list anyway um i was then taken into my cell locked in and it was like a an introduction wing um, sorry, my camera's a bit weird. Um, and there was about, I think there was about 15 other women on there. I can't really remember fully. I think there was about 15 to 20 women on there. Um, it was loud. Um, all hours it was loud. So if you was, you know, not a very light, if you're a light sleeper, you're not going to get much sleep in prison. Um, no matter whether it's 5 in the morning or 12 at night, it's shouting, bickering, um... Just loud, you know, and you wouldn't necessarily expect that from women, but they are, they're loud, and there's a lot of psychological warfare going on, like, it's true, you know, women don't necessarily fight as much, but they're more sneaky, and they're quite cruel, actually, they're quite vindictive, they say stuff under the breath, and they give you funny looks, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gay, so they kind of suss that out, and I, I'm not shy about that do you know what i mean so if someone straight up asked me i'm, I'm gay are you gay and i was like yeah and to be honest most people are all right about that in prison because a lot of women in prison are actually gay or bisexual um and <laughs> yeah um there's also there's a bit of an expectation that you're gonna be with somebody also in prison which i found a bit pressurizing because i'm quite a private person in that sense like i'm not well not private but I don't, I don't really do relationships, I like, I'm quite non, I'm, I'm non-monogamous, so I have maybe a, one or two partners at once, um, at, at the moment I'm not seeing anybody because I can't be bothered, but I am not the kind of person to just be with one person, I, I love that person and all that, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me, um, but I had quite a lot of people come up to me and say, oh yeah, you can be my girlfriend in the prison and stuff, and it's, you do feel pressured and stuff. I mean, I wasn't there long enough, but I imagine that if I was doing, like, a long stretch, like, I might have become a, a, a relationship with somebody for the sake of fitting in, and that's not necessarily helpful. Um, but then again, you're lonely in there. Um, you know, when I was in my cell, I mean, it, the staff are all... Ugh, the staff are trained in mental health, so you can't necessarily blame the staff. They're not mental health counsellors or they don't have any training, I don't think, um, in it. Um, they do first aid training, I know that. Because I've looked at what it takes to become a prison guard and there isn't really any mental health training. You get taught on basic self-harm and how to stop someone from self-harming, like physically, like restraints and the signs, but... They don't have any, like, in-depth training, so... And a lot of the staff are quite cruel, actually, I'll say that. Um, I remember I said, you know... The small things become big things in prison. Like, you get locked in a cell at about... I mean, sometimes you didn't come out yourself. I mean, it's not a case of, you know, like, you see on the films where they're out in the yard every day. That doesn't happen in jail, because they're always underfunded. Um... Sometimes I did not come out myself, and that was, it was sometimes by choice, but mostly it was because there wasn't enough staff. 
to supervise the activities or to let us out. Um, so, you know, you ate in your room, you watched TV in your room, you slept in your room, and you didn't speak to anyone. There's no phones, there's nothing. You get a kettle if you're not a prolific self-harmer at that point. I mean, I wasn't going to use hot water, so I was all right in hot water. Um, you get plastic, spoon, knife and fork. You get a very small little TV. Sometimes you get a radio, it depends. You get a block single bed, which is like really blue plastic foam. It's really hard to sleep on, it's horrible. And that's your lot. Oh, you get a tea pack as well. You get a breakfast pack um, in the morning. Every day you get given like a pack, which has got like cereal in it, milk in it. It's like condensed, it's like, not condensed, sorry. It's, and that UHT milk. I like it, but a lot of people say it's minging. Um, <laughs> I like that kind of milk. You know that, the milk that never goes off. It's like, um, yeah, it's that stuff. I like it, but a lot of people don't. And you, sometimes you've got like a sandwich in there or biscuits. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's basic. It's back to basics. And they don't give out coffee. I mean, that's my experience of New Hall. Um, coffee was kind of um, a rarity and people swapped. There was a lot of swapping on there. And there was a lot of people asking for your shit in there. You know, there was no peace. So the routine was... You know, you wake up, you get knocked at about 8 in the morning. Um, then you go for a shower. Um, I love my showers, so, you know, I liked that. But you don't get long in there because there's about 20 other people on the introduction wing. And when you get into the main wing, there's about 80. So, you know, it's it's quick because someone's going to say, hurry up, it's my turn. Um, and then after that... You you back in your cell um, again unless you know you've got work and that doesn't necessarily get handed out if you classed as like depressed or got mental issues or certain things like crams you won't be given a job for a very long time it sometimes takes six months to get a job longer some people never get given jobs so if you don't have a job you're in your cell pretty much all day long um, but then yeah that's it. And then it's lunchtime. You usually come out your room, come out for lunchtime. I normally sat in my room because I didn't like mixing with the other people in there because I didn't want to form any kind of friendships or relationships in there. I wasn't going to be in there long and I just didn't want people knowing my business. I was in there for struggling and a lot of the time I was crying and you have to kind of keep yourself to yourself in prison like you can't show any real kind of in my opinion you can't show too much like soppiness and because they do find it funny actually the women the when the times I was in prison they kind of take it as a weakness so they might you know they notice that you're depressed and then they'll start giving you extra like milk or coffee I mean I love my coffee and then, like, they'll ask for money back. They'll be like, oh, well, I gave you this and that, so you owe me. You owe me now. It's your debt. So it's... don't. My advice is don't lend in prison, like, unless you know somebody, unless you get clicked up with somebody. Um, I was in a pad on my own. Like, I was in a cell on my own. I was single-celled because of this, what I was doing to myself. And, like, I understand, like, it wasn't wouldn't necessarily be fair to, like put someone else through that. Um, I did self-harm in prison a few times because I was so ill, like, I was struggling so much that like, I kind of wanted to die. Um, and my experiences of that was... I was... Sometimes, like, they just used to come and say, don't be ridiculous, and then gave me a load of plasters. I know, compassionate or what. And other times, they... They took me to the mental ward in the prison where I stayed and it was worse there, actually. I'd, I'd say it's worse there because they don't have any compassion. I mean, the staff there, I remember one staff member and she saying, oh, welcome to the loony bin where all the crazies are. And it's like, I looked and I said, do you think that's appropriate to be saying that? And they said, well, it's true. And that's the kind of characters you get in prison. I mean, I refer to this a lot in... 
when I write. I call them power whores because you get a set of keys and you think, you know, you think you're God, like you can control everything. And it's like, that's the kind of characters you get in these prisons and hospitals as well, mental hospitals and care rooms. You know, where there's vulnerable people, you get a lot of predators. And yeah, I mean, I, I know that staff brought contraband in. Um, I know it's a big thing for me to say on this video. Yeah, they, they did. They did. And I'm, I'm talking about cannabis. I know that I'm not going to name them, but certain staff brought weed in. Um, they bought, if I remember rightly, like they brought some DVDs in. Um, they brought... Well, that's actually no. That's all I remember them bringing in. They're bringing in cannabis and some DVDs, but still, you know, you shouldn't be smoking cannabis in the prison, and the the, the wear. So it's, I don't know how they managed to arrange that, but drugs were smuggled. Like the patients used to struggle. Uh, not patients, sorry. The inmates used to smuggle the um, the drugs in all sorts of ways, like food tray. Normally, like, if you're working in the kitchen, um, that way, and all sorts of ways, you know what I mean? But obviously, I'm not going to drop people in. I don't remember people's names anyway, and I'm not, like, a class A snitch, but this is more of, like, an informational video, so, like, tell people what goes on. Um, yeah, but, yeah, there are a lot of, ben, you know, jail guards, and it's true. I mean, I did not feel safe in the jail, um... I felt at risk of assault because I did get in a few arguments with certain prisoners because, you know, when I was trying to sleep, you know, one of them kept singing on a night, like, real loud singing. And it's cool, like, you know, you're in jail and it's a tough situation and it's really terrible, but, you know, you're keeping me from my sleep. And I did confront her actually I said can you keep it down on a night and she basically just like laughed in my face and said fuck off newbie and that and it's like well no I'm gonna report you and she's like threatened me like she just went came right up to my cell because this as well people can just like walk into your cell like unless you choose to get it locked it's like the staff come and open your door at eight in the morning they unlock it and open it and so you wake up and your door's open and it's like, anybody can just walk in your cell. So, like, if you're not careful, and if, like, get on the wrong side of somebody, they'll just come in your cell and hit you or all sorts of stuff. Um, I, well, I did feel at risk, and I felt scared, and I felt my life's at risk. And I did tell staff, actually, I said, I do believe that people are probably going to hurt me in here because I'm quite a quiet person, and I'm not going to do trades with people, and... I'm not really into the drug scene. Like, I was offered all sorts. Like, I was offered... There's more drugs on the inside than outside. Literally. I was offered... Um, I don't know all these code words, but I was offered spice and something else. Speed, I think it was. She had it in a person, I do believe. Like, in her orifices, I do think it was. I, I didn't ask her where it was, but, you know, she said, oh, I've got it somewhere. And I said, brilliant. I said, I'm not really into that, but, you know, cool. Um, and then she was trying to get me to sell it. And she's like, oh, well, do you know someone that wants it? And you can, you know, I was like, no, 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 no. Be careful with stuff like that. Um, because a lot of people come into the prison free on drugs and then they leave the prison ad addicted to substances. So it's... I'm quite strong-minded. If I don't want to do something, I'll say no, 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 no. Um, a lot of people aren't, a lot of people are vulnerable and to put somebody that's self-harming and suicidal and literally on the death door, like, of going to kill herself into a prison where they get offered drug substances every day is... It's, it's evil. I've, I, I'll go that far and say it's evil. I mean, this is how the, what they're doing to people. Um, this serenity, integrated mentoring stuff... Um, it's this is why so many people are ending up in prison. Um, you know, if you, I'll I'll put a link to it in the description as well. Um, if you don't know what it is, so basically, um, 
in the UK, people are getting arrested and, like I said, sent to prison for attempting suicide or self-harming and stuff because they're classing it as challenging behaviour now and drain on our resources, which is basically their way of saying struggling is a drain on our society. If you've got problems, fuck you, you're not useful to us. So we're going to lock you away and pretend you don't exist. We're not going to look at the root of the issue. You know, We're not going to help you get counselling or therapies. We're going to chuck you in prison and, and, and treat you like a criminal. That is what goes on. I've got a lot of friends in the States and um, it's heading that way now here. Um, it's really bad. I mean, horrible. I mean... Anything else I can think of for prison? I mean, you get a TV in your room. I mean, I'm not a massive TV watcher. I mean, it's basic TV. You get free view. Um, there's no phones allowed. Um, you're not allowed anything you can imagine. You're not really allowed, really. Um, but you're allowed more in prison than a mental hospital. Because when I was in a mental ward, you weren't allowed your mobile phone. And you weren't allowed... Even shoelaces on your shoes. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it all depends on the prison. They've all got different rules, but... Yeah, I mean, for me, you're allowed very little. Um, but I love writing, and that doesn't take much. It takes a pen and a piece of paper, so... Yeah, I'm lucky in that respect. Um, relationships and, like, sex happened a lot in prison. Um, and there was a lot of these slang... Um, you know, gay for the stay and stuff like that, or les for the stay. And um, I don't know, like, it, I wasn't in a good mental place. Um, and I felt a bit vulnerable, but, you know, I did witness some sex um, happen, um, mainly in the showers. Um, women used to please each other and enjoy sex with each other. Um and that was cool. Um, I, I kissed another woman while I was in there and I did undress her a little bit. And it's just enjoyment. I mean, it's frowned upon and stuff and I kind of get it. Like, you don't want to get too clicked up with somebody in prison, but we're humans and everyone's got to have needs and everyone needs a bit of sex and fun and... So, yeah, it does happen in prison, probably more so in, in female prisons than male prisons, because a lot of men don't like gay, it's not masculine and stuff like that, which is ridiculous. That I couldn't care less if you're gay or straight or an alien visiting from Mars, like, be happy. And so, yeah, there's a lot of open relationships in, in the female prisons. Like, you'll see a lot of women holding hands and they'll be like, oh, yeah, we had sex last night or oh yeah, I fingered her last night in the shower and stuff, and they're quite open about it, and the staff usually say, oh, don't do that, or don't say that, but how can you stop that happening? I mean, it's funny in a way, but it's the opposite of, like I said, male prisons, because in male prisons, you get a lot of friends, and you get a lot of cliques and gangs, but there's not open, like, oh yeah, me and him had sex last night, or me and him kissed or whatever, because it's kind of like... They might be targeted for being gay kind of thing. Um, but yeah, um, it wasn't a good experience. I'll say it, like, do you know what I mean? It wasn't a good experience at all, to be honest. It was scary, you know? And I relied on the Samaritans. I couldn't really speak to my dad on the phone very much because I didn't really get um, to access the phone often because it costs... It's a bit of a con because you have to put, let's say, £10 on your phone and, like, three or four phone calls and it's gone. Like, and the short phone calls, like, maybe six or seven minutes and then it's gone, your phone. So £10 for 20 minutes. It's a con and, yeah, it's not a good experience. But, yeah, if you've got any more questions, like, feel free to put them in the comments and I'll answer them because I'm pretty honest and, uh, like I said, I want to raise awareness of what goes on. Um, it's not right what goes on and... Um, it all needs improving. It's underfunded the prison system and full of mentally ill people that are desperate and need support, not, you know, incarceration. Yeah, um, thank you for watching. Look, I'm trying to get to a thousand in the next few weeks. I would really, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe and, you know, give it a share and a like. Um, but yeah, 
If you've got any questions, ask, and I will see you shortly. It's been Michelle. Adios for now, amigos.